Okay, we are live. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks to our IT department who's helped us set up this meeting today. Uh, we appreciate the, the support that comes to the back end of this type of work um, to make sure all of our technologies for our, our broadcast are working with the link set up. And so we appreciate the hard work um, of our folks back in our information technology department. Uh, good evening, my folks. My name is Ward Andrus. I'm the uh, superintendent here at Central Union High School District. Um, as you know, we're experiencing this crazy pandemic, which is very challenging and frightening and very, very real for those who have suffered loss. Um, it's forced, as you know, all of our schools into this distance learning mode. Um, however, as we proceed forward with this school year, hopefully your students have experienced and you're experiencing uh, a different uh, learning experience than we had in the spring quarter, that fourth quarter of last school year. Um, as this last school year came to an end, um, that fourth quarter it was very much like evacuation and here's some work and let me know how you do and we'll catch up by email and a phone call and it was very uh, wasn't very structured and as all districts in the state of California and specifically us here in Central Union High School District as we move forward um, we are uh, returning to more of a pattern of learning the regular structure of a daily schedule and kind of the pace that's that's that we would expect with the regular school year um, there is still some flexibility because we know that not every family situation is identical. Um, and, and we also have needs of our employees with teachers and, and their conditions as well. So there's a little more flexibility built into online learning. I have some background in online learning. I was uh, actually my doctorate dissertation was all about online learning. So I have some experience in it. And my own children uh, years ago did some high school classes for a few years, uh, two years or so of online learning. So I'm somewhat experienced in it um, from a parent perspective. And, and having studied the topic. So we're gonna share with you our distance learning plan. It's our, we're calling this the road ahead for fall 2020. Um, it's our best effort that we have at this point in time. We're gonna share this with you and kind of where it comes from. Um, later towards the end of the presentation, um, or if you want to post them now, you can put a question in the chat. Um, but if you wanna wait till the end, we'll do our best to read through each question and try and accommodate it. A lot of the answers are found online on our webpage. And so, um, we can, we, if you navigate, like open another window and look on that, you'll be able to see that. So what I'll do is I'm gonna share my screen now and, we sh and we'll present this uh, slide deck to everyone. And these slides are also available online in a PDF. The same place where you registered for this meeting is where these slides now live. And the Spanish version is on their way. So as we move forward, looking into next year, we received guidance for opening schools, kind of what do we anticipate? What is the state and the county telling us? And so we received guidance. We've been working on it for a while, long before this came out in the month of April and May and June. But in the middle of June, we got this, uh, Stronger Together is the name of this book. Uh, it's about 60, 70 pages, I believe, of guidance for the reopening of schools in California. They are guidelines, not directions, not directives and specific things. But they really talk about following the local health officials requirements, practicing physical distancing, developing a distance learning plan, which you'll see in a little bit, and bringing students on campus as soon as it's practicable. They also, the state provided us with a guarantee of 60 day supply of uh, personal protective equipment for teachers and students coming throughout the year. And we've actually already received our first order of that. We also received guidance from our county um, Office of Education and Prince superintendents meet every Wednesday. We have since March, every Wednesday, and there's been a Wednesday morning meeting of superintendents, um, even through the summer to determine, figure out what we're doing and what steps are next and what are the state telling us and what does the budget look like and all of those types of implications for schools. So the County Office of Education has been, supple or has been instrumental in helping us prepare. They again provided us guidelines, not directions, not specifics, but guidelines and they mirror what the state said. So it's following local health official requirements, practicing physical distancing, developing your distance learning plan, and bringing students on. The County Office of Education is our distributor of that 60 day supply of materials for teachers and students and our employees. So they were actually already uh, got to us the first shipment of materials. And we have masks and hand sanitizers and um, uh, contactless temperature takers, thermometers and so forth. So that's all part of the plan and the materials the state and the county have provided to us. Also a partner in this is the county health department. We really don't proceed until we have authorization to move forward with the county health officials. And they've been our guidance along with our county, our local county office of education on what we can and can't do, how to reopen, how to prepare. Even getting our grounds crew and our, our food service workers to work 
and providing services and maintenance of buildings all required coordination with our county health department. So currently um, in the roadmap to recovery, the, our understanding guidance is that students can return to campus when we are at stage 2B, 2B. Currently we're back to stage one and that's where we started back in March. March was stage one, everybody, you know, everyone evacuate and, and be away from schools. Um, only essential workers could be at work. We progressed to stage 2A, which allowed us to open our office a little more, and we brought back our maintenance workers at that point in time, uh, but then they slid us back to stage 1. However, all school employees, from campus monitors and security workers to office staff to teachers, to even myself, the superintendent, all of us are considered essential workers. And since school is happening, most of us are at the school sites doing the essential work. Now, part of it is, is we have to have a daily health screening. And so, but it does not have to be temperature checks and it doesn't have to be an active process where someone is checking you. Uh, you can do a self check and that is good. So we follow all those guidelines from them. We maintain physical distancing. We wear masks and we can't stay six feet apart. There's enhanced sanitizing and access to hand washing and hand sanitizing throughout our schools and campuses. And so even here in our other offices. So those are the guidance we received to proceed with opening. <clears throat> Very important to us though, was the state law that was passed called Senate Bill 98. And that was signed into law on June 29th of this year. And this is kind of the language that tells us what to do in terms of rules and laws. And it came out the end of June, not at the beginning of June when we got the guidance from the state, this came out afterwards. There's a couple of key pieces that I wanna make sure parents and people understand. The really important piece to all of us here in schools and to parents and students is this phrase right here daily live interaction with certified employees and peers. Daily live interaction does not necessarily always mean a video call like we're experiencing right now. It doesn't have to be a video conference, but it should be every day and it should be live interaction with your teacher and peers. So things like the threaded discussion boards, there's other activities where students can post reactions to videos or comments. There's many different ways to, to have it in exchange where you're learning together but it does not require a video conference. We do recommend it. That is the best way to do that. We think it's a great way to reach out to students, but we also recognize not every student's computer is the best one, or maybe their own home environment isn't very conducive for a video conference. Um, there's, some variety, there's some things that may get in the way of having a daily video. That's why the law was open-ended this way, that there's other forms of telephone communication our internet connectedness in order to, to make this happen. But it is, should be every school day, students have some interaction with a teacher or teachers and their peers during the course of the day. But it should be every school day. And today we just finished day number six. So we have 174 to go. Um, attendance and weekly progress monitoring. Also written into this law is that we take attendance every day. So it was very important for us to get back into the regular pattern of a school day and school bell schedule because we are taking attendance every class period. So if a student has six periods of their class assignment, that means they should be logging on and checking in every period. Teachers are marking their attendance every period to see who's participating in the daily live interaction activities. Um, and so, and that's recorded in the ARIES system. You might be part of or have access to the parent portal in ARIES and you can also log in and see what information is being taken. Uh, part of it too is that we do this because counselors and administrators are following up to see who's not participating. Um, on the first day of school, it, I think at one high school at Southwest, they were down to only 34 students that had not logged on or been part of a class, uh, or maybe it was Central, one of the two schools, very small number. So we have very high engagement, which was terrific. We have over 90% attendance uh, on the very first week of school of kids logging in and actively engaged in their classes, either with live interaction or if they're doing it later in the day and following up with assignments and activities that also counts as present. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. We also, teachers have to monitor student progress weekly. So teachers should keep weekly records of their student progress on their assignments, um, activities, or if there's a discussion they're supposed to take part in and participate in and things they're turning in. Um, and there are due dates. Uh, that was a question that came up earlier. It's like, my child is, you know, the teacher's not accepting late work. Well, that's the case of in-person instruction. They don't accept late work. Maybe you can make an accommodation that way. But this is much more like regular school in terms of expectations and the timeliness of it, meaning you're doing things on time than we did in the fourth quarter when it was very open-ended and you had a much larger window of time to complete work. Because they are keeping wait 
regular weekly records of activities. So there are due dates and that people are trying to follow. So before school even started, there were many things that we took on long before back in the summer. One of them was preparing registration options. We had a, had a traditional registration paper packet and that was for all new students and all ninth graders. Uh, but we did improve it with, we streamlined it with simplified formats and reductions of forms and paperwork that were included in it. We also reopened the, um, in Aries was a student data confirmation. That's the phrase. Basically it's an online registration where you confirm your existing students information, maybe update a cell phone number or address if you moved, but it was an, an online process. And that way you restarted that this for this school year. And that also, we, that way we could reduce the amount of time people spent in line or people even coming to the school to register. So we tried to minimize that as much as possible and prove it. Devices, we have handed out today over 2,200 devices. Um, that's over half of the number of students have received their very own Chromebook. So real quick, what a Chromebook is, it's a simple, it's a laptop that's uh, designed just for the internet. Um, it doesn't have extra drops like a CD player or a DVD player or something like that. Well, I dated myself with CD player. It doesn't have some of those things. It's a very simplified internet interaction device with a, a speaker and a microphone and a camera and a screen and a keyboard. We also provided what's called a MiFi device. And that's similar to a device that catches the internet. Um, the MiFi device is linked up to a system called Borderlink. Borderlink is like Verizon or AT&T internet but Borderlink is just in Imperial County and it's just for education and government purposes. So we are very fortunate in our county to have this system. Um, we have handed out actually 99 MiFi devices so far this year for students who don't have internet service. We've handed out again over 2,200 Chromebooks uh, for all of them. Uh, we have them more have been purchased to kind of backfill so we have extras on hand. Students can check out either one as needed. And we don't distinguish, like if it doesn't have to be free or reduced lunch or some other type of student, or it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Any um, district student may um, get one of these devices. So it's not based on income or household or things like that. So we'll provide a Chromebook to each student. And again, it's per student, not household. We're not likely really ever to return to where we just turn in the Chromebooks and they live in a Chromebook cart that goes around the classrooms and kids borrow them throughout the day. And then they go home and do something separate. We're actually probably, we're moving to what we call a one-to-one -one initiative where every student is issued their own Chromebook if they would like one, and they have to bring it or their own device to and from school every day. The only time we would use Chromebooks would be for testing. And that comes to do with um, management and sanitation of the Chromebooks between classes. Uh, there'll be plenty of fear after COVID-19 will return to, to school about, hey, who cleaned my Chromebook last? I don't know who used it, I don't wanna touch it. Therefore, if you have your own device, it's, it's checked out to the student. But as of right now, we have over 2,200 Chromebooks out and um, any student who needs one at this point in time can still ask for one. We have still plenty to hand out. Textbooks, before school started, we started providing textbooks. Our teachers um, provided a list of the needed textbooks and that was available when they picked up their schedules. There were a few textbook requests from teachers that came in a little late and we're doing our best to accommodate those and get those materials distributed now. But not all courses need a textbook. Uh, some courses, all the material is online. Many textbook publishers actually have tremendous, really rich resources as their textbook materials online, and students can simply access them, or they may have a code through the classroom in which they access textbooks. Uh, but if they need a textbook and their teacher has requested it, they are available from their schools to check out books. So starting a school was August 11th, um, almost two weeks or a week ago today. So, and yes, we're all familiar now, it's distance learning for all to start the school year. We had made this decision early uh, at the end of June and made that announcement in the email I sent out to all parents on, in the end of June. Um, however, the governor made this announcement also in July and we've been heading and preparing this way. Again, we're in stage one and we can't introduce students until we get to stage two B. And so we're following this guidance. Um, as conditions permit, we can allow certain groups of students on campus, like small groups, like two and three small amounts as we progress through our opening until we can actually have 25% have or half the students on campus at a time based on physical distancing requirements. So in order to do this, we have to have some safety precautions and there's expectations from the county, uh, the county health department and the county office of education. So our plans are aligned and have been approved with the health department and with the county office of education. 
So again, a big piece of that, and this is for our employees right now, say the principal or school secretaries or even our maintenance workers. We ask that everyone do a daily health screening prior to coming to work. And that daily health screening is found on our webpage. And I'll show that to you later in the, in the discussion. No temperature taking is required, but it is available. So we have some enhanced screening if someone requests it. Masks uh, when persons can't maintain six feet of physical distancing. And when we're at school and during passing period, we'll ask students to make sure they wear their mask. It's a requirement they wear their masks um, because of that incidental passing contact. We, don't, we just wanna mitigate the potential spread. So we have signs and reminders posted throughout the schools and our offices. We have hand sanitizer available in all of our classrooms and reminders to wash your hands regularly. And of course, daily sanitizing of schools and buses. So it's not just cleaning up the dirt. It's also sanitizing the surfaces for um, microbials and germs. Um, we've purchased some uh, enhanced equipment that does this, the sanitization, not just cleaning. And that's available at all of our schools and our buses. Um, our, our folks will actually put on a big backpack and go through and spray all the surfaces, similar to maybe stories you've seen or pictures you might have seen about this happening on airplanes. It's the same type of equipment we've purchased um, that's used in industry. We're using it in our schools, our classrooms and buses. So as soon as we're able to, we want to introduce on-campus classes and meetings. And so um, I'm going to share this first part, like how we can do this and, and uh, what's driving, like what's the, why do we want to do this? We're really concerned about equity and learning loss. We're worried about those who are less fortunate, um, who may not have the same family background or support or well-being. And so they don't have the same type of access or support, but they do get that at school. And so, for example, some of our more wealthy families have hired tutors at home to help supervise the online teaching that the teachers are doing, but they've got a tutor in the room as well. Other families are not that fortunate and maybe both parents are working and our high school student is also helping brother and sister or brother and brother or family, siblings. Maybe they live with grandparents who aren't as, not as technically capable or they've got slow Wi-Fi. Wh whatever it is, it's not the same. So we're, we want to get students back to school as soon as it's safe. We're also concerned about learning loss. Um, today was the first day of school for Los Angeles Unified and they were talking to parents and parents on the news story today. They were concerned about my child hasn't done as much work this last school quarter. I'm afraid they're falling behind. We are too. So we want to get back to regular instruction that we're all used to as soon as possible. So we'll probably introduce students in very small groups and teachers may elect to have like their CTE classes, like say a, a lab of some kind or a construction class or a culinary class or the ag teacher says, we're gonna get together with three to five students and have these little mini meetings where we're all safe, but we can get together in person and do these things. That won't happen until we're in stage 2B. But this may also be our English learners, our special education students, um, our science lab activities, our music and performing groups may want to get together with small groups to do some of this work and prepare for an ensemble or a performance that they're gonna capture or do and get those experiences. We miss that, and I think our students do too. So as soon as it's safe for us to do it and we're in a place we can do that, we will. Recently, I think last Friday, the governor has issued some new guidance on how special education classes may be able to return to campus. Um, we'll be working with the County Office of Education and providing as much notification to the special education families as soon as that's available. So we've developed what we call our phases of instruction. This is uh, kind of goes along what the county stages of instruction are, but this is called phases of instruction. This is our phase. So right now we are in phase one of distance learning for all students. So that's where we are right now. When we get to phase two, that's those small groups like the CTE class, the performing arts group, English learners. That's when we get to stage two, excuse me, phase two, which would be the county stage 2B. Uh, number three, we can begin classes uh, for in blended sections, meaning some students come to school on a Tuesday, other kids come on a Wednesday, another set of students come Thursday and someone else Friday. So it's 25% uh, of the class. So seven to eight students per classroom, roughly, would be able to come to class. Uh, but the rest of the students would be online doing work, eight, what we call asynchronous. You're just doing online distance learning that day and not in class. When we progress through our phases and it's safe and the physical distancing requirements are limited or lessened, we would move to 50%. So half of our students would come to uh, class, the other half would be home at that day. So these are very challenging, number three and four, in terms of management of classes for a teacher. As you might imagine, if I've got 
18, 20 kids in front of me in a classroom, but I've got 20 students online on my computer. How do I do both things at the same time? So it's very difficult and we're trying to work through the details of that, but we do know that at some point in time, we can return students to campus and we'll be working through those challenges. Our phase five is when we're fully open and the school day can resume and all of our students can return at the same time. And there's the possibility that this won't happen until the next school year. Uh, we'll see how things progress with vaccines and safety and testing conditions and therapies as has been described over the past few months, but this may not be for quite a while. So tools and services for teachers and students. These are things we've added to make the learning better. Again, in the fourth quarter of last school year, they were just like packets and I'll send you an email and I'm starting a Google Classroom and we'll try and figure it out and log in with your phone. And it was all over the place. That was very, very difficult, very confusing and challenging for families and we know it. Um, and so we took steps during the summer to try and prepare so that we are much more prepared and, and, and ready for this next school year. So the first thing and very important is our new Gmail accounts for all students. In the past, students could use their own personal email account to access their classrooms, not any longer. Students must use the district provided Gmail account that the system creates and generates for all students and there's instructions on Gmail accounts for students on our website. And I'll show that to you when we're done with the presentation, because that may help answer some questions that may come up in the chat. Another part is called G Suite for Education. This is oftentimes, oftentimes called Google Docs or your Google Drive, but G Suite for Education is what is your Google Classroom, Google Streaming, Google Meet, Google Docs, Google Slides, like this is Google Slides. And those other features that are all set up for classrooms is part of the G Suite. We're looking for the next version of that, which includes many new safety features and protocols that aren't in the current materials, the current system. So we're looking forward to that. Another platform is called Remind.com. Remind.com is a private business that um, we're looking to buy their services for all of our teachers, but it is a text messaging app that protects everyone's cell phone numbers. So if a teacher says, hey, please join my Remind class with that link, when they register, they their um, information comes to the teacher, but no one else. So when they respond to a, like a group, you know, text message discussion, no one else can see their numbers. So those numbers are protected, but they can still communicate. It's very effective. I, um, my wife is a teacher. She uses it all the time. I've seen great uses of remind.com. It's very helpful. Other things that we're doing is the district is dedicating at least $40,000 in, in budget just for what we call ancillary technology. This would be headsets for teachers, microphones for teachers, a camera like the, uh, the, web, the web camera um, or a scanning tool or a writing stylus tool used like a stylus pen that's used for annotating slides. Um, we are providing that hardware for teachers and the training that goes with it so they can better support distance learning. And then when we do return for in-class instruction, I don't, the, the Google classrooms won't go away, but we will use them differently. It's called a flipped classroom where students do lots of learning online on their own, like watching a video or doing a threaded discussion. So when they come to class, they're more prepared for the day's activities and teachers do more time interacting with students rather than just telling students about content or materials or lessons. To help us with uh, other, other areas, we're adding Wi-Fi to all of our school buses. The Wi-Fi will connect to Borderlink. That's that service that uh, school districts have for internet. And that way students, when they are riding the bus would have access to Wi-Fi while on the bus. We're also offering meals, we're providing meals for register, only for registered students, but they're free for all of our registered students. So any Central Union High School District student can get a free breakfast and lunch. So meals are curbside at all three schools. And they're also being delivered to feeder schools. And I have a slide coming up with a little more detail on that. So we also recognize that some of our students need some additional support, meaning well, and so it's like we call, um, we call this tier two or tier three um, or level two or level three. In reality, all of our students get level one support. They get a teacher who's there all the time for them. They provide instruction. They're there if they need to be connected to resources or maybe they need a referral somewhere else for help. Oftentimes our teachers, they do provide lots of counseling and services and support to our students beyond just being a regular classroom. Here's the instruction. But tier two is when a student needs a little more help. Maybe they need some tutoring services or some occasional help with that. Maybe they want to talk to a counselor. They've got a question about friends or something's going on in their life. And they just want to talk to somebody. These are what we call tier two or level two support. 
Some of those services are more intense, meaning we need more tutoring services or we need more behavioral or mental health services. It's not a bad thing. We're glad that we have them. We wanna connect students to those services. And so we have tier three interventions and supports as well. So that's part of our plan is that we also provide these types of services for our students for their mental and well-being. This question comes up often. What about the what about the football season or what about the you know winter concert? What about those things? Are we going to have them? So let's start with athletics. Uh, this California Interscholastic Federation or CIF announced there'll be no sports um, this fall or winter and that these things have actually been merged into, so fall and winter got moved into the winter season and some winter sports got moved into spring. So there's a spring winter season. Hopefully, everyone cross your fingers that we can have these events. If conditions allow, we'll be able to have the sports in the winter that will include fall seasons and winter seasons together and so on. It'll be very, very busy if we can do this. Athletics have their own guidelines and rules set forward by CIF. For example, some equipment can't go home. So a student, like a football player's helmet and pads cannot leave the school grounds. They have to stay there because they have to be sanitized overnight before they are used again. Our officials that come on to officiate a volleyball game or something along those lines, normally officials come in in their street clothes, they go to a locker room and they change and they come out and they officiate the games. Not anymore, they're, they must come dressed, already ready to officiate um, so that they're not in another room where we'd have to go back and sanitize that or they would be exposed to that type of stuff. So um, there's rules set out that we have to follow there. Other activities like concerts and um, drama performances or things like that, uh, recitals, they'll follow the same phases of instruction. As soon as we can have students on campus, we can have practices for athletics or practices for other performances. Um, when we return and actually have performances, we'll follow the county health department orders. So some at the beginning, it may be only the, the students and their immediate families can participate. And then depending on how things are, we can then add larger or more, more public uh, to like to a football game or to a, a, a basketball event or a cross country meet or to a, a concert recital. Um, we can add uh, the public to that once we conditions allow that to move forward. So let me circle back here to the child nutrition or, or meals, uh, breakfast and lunch. So again, they are free to all registered students. So as long as a student is registered as one of our students at our school, our high schools, they can get free meals. There's daily pickup at all three high schools between 9.30 and 11.30. And the student doesn't have to be present, but the parent would have to come and they have a, a card that they would be able to present that information's on our website around child nutrition. Remote delivery begins next Monday, Monday the 24th. Um, it'll be on Mondays and Wednesdays. We'll pack like a multi-meal kit into a bag or a box and you'll receive multiple meals. That'll be around 10 o'clock at the following locations. We recognize not everyone can come and make it to our high schools. So we're going to set up remote delivery at the KOA um, towards the Meadows Elementary District area. I'm out in Sealy and in Heber and two more locations here in El Centro. So those buses will be around at the, roughly those bus stop areas where the buses normally stop. There'll be a bus driver and a child nutrition person distributing meals. So we want to get as many meals out to families and students as possible uh, for our children so they have food during the day and they're not worried about um, and getting that meal. Again, free to all registered students. The student doesn't have to be present, but someone has to come and pick it up on their behalf um, and remote delivery begins next week. So all along this process, um, these are some things that are important to us that help us understand what to do and how we need to proceed. Um, we need to have some flexibility. As you can see, things change and evolve. I mean, just last Friday, the governor said, oh, by the way, you can have special ed classrooms on campus for the really most needy students. That came last Friday and we'd already started the school year. So we have to then make an adjustment and we'll then communicate those adjustments with the family. So we really have to be flexible in our approach and this includes families. We can't get locked into one set pattern, but we need something that we can rely on. And that's why we've made those schedule changes. So we have regular bell schedules. Um, over time, we'll make changes to who's attending on campus, different group sizes and meetings, and we'll communicate officially on the district webpage. So we'll be using social media to point people to this webpage. Um, so if you see something on the district social media, that may be a little bit of information, but it will also link you or direct you to more information on here on this one. And this is the one we wanna point people to, is COVID-19 recovery plan off of our main page. And at the end of the presentation, I'll show you the website. 
So what we're doing now is developing our learning continuity attendance plan. This was also part of the law that we develop a plan. And you can see all the elements we've discussed. So the learning continuity and attendance plan has to be adopted by September 30th. We're doing public input and review, which is what we're doing tonight, actually. Our plans include like, what does our instruction and participation look like? How do we attract attendance? What are the technologies and hardware plans? What about tiered intervention, like social and emotional supports? We've talked about that. There's a public hearing uh, in a separate meeting on September 15th, and then approval at the board meeting on September 29th. So there'll be more information coming and we'll share this as soon as we have more plans public and people can learn more about it. We're having community input meetings. We had one earlier this morning at 11 o'clock and there's this one tonight at six. And then um, next week in Espanol, para los que solamente hablan Espanol, tendremos una reunión el 25 de agosto a las 11 de la mañana y también a las 6 de la noche. Para las familias que solamente hablan Espanol, yo trataré de hacer esta uh, presentación en español, pero también vamos a tener a alguien para traducir uh, en, uh, si yo necesito ayuda uh, con algunas palabras o para explicar algo o para responder a algunas preguntas. All right, that was my best shot at Spanish for that period of time. So we will be going this in Spanish next week. So please share this information with those in your community, um, those your family and friends, even those who are only Spanish speakers, please pass this information along we want to make sure they have an opportunity to hear it as well. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing for this slide for a minute and take questions. Um, I'm also going to open up the district web page so we can see resources that are available to us. So I'm going to go back to sharing just for, a, oh, we got it already. Oh, someone said my Spanish is great. Well, muchas gracias. <laughs> Hace algunos años te está hablando en español cada día. Y me faltan algunas palabras de vez en cuando, pero mayormente puedo comunicar por algunos minutos. Pero, uh, anyways, I still have to practice. We'll just say that. Let me share my screen again. Uh, so just share with folks the, the information about where you can find more information. Um, so you should be able to see our district web page at this point in time. So if you were to go to our home page, we've updated with some new pictures, of course. Um, we've added to improve the communication. We've added a regular weekly video. Um, I also posted this last week on our district Facebook page. It's just a short two to three minute video with current news from around the district, um, links to resources or things to do. We've got one in the works for next week as for this week. They'll post later at the end of the week. Um, but the school year has started. And so what we've done is we have a tab right up here at the top that says the COVID-19 recovery plan. So if you follow that, you can find the information about all the things that we've been working on and discussed today. Here's the information about the recovery page. And this link of course would take you to the county uh, health department. The um, information here, these are links to those uh, different agencies to their web pages. There's flyers about the coronavirus and how to prevent it. Uh, for previous board presentations are available. And then those guidance documents I referenced in the beginning, they're all here as well. Um, you obviously made it to here because you registered. Um, and so the presentation we posted that we just saw is now here in, in English. We'll post the Spanish one shortly. But a very important resource here is down below under daily live interaction. Some parents need help with these tools and I don't blame you. Some of this is new and it's hard. And I, I can't keep up. My wife is very talented at this, but I'm learning with everybody else as well. So we have this great page and it's, it's our always learning page. And these are resources for students and families. And it's kind of like, what do you do for the first day, right? Make sure to check your schedule. There's information here about the step-by-step -step what to do, including visit your school website and getting to the Aries, parent, Aries student portal that looks like this. A student will log in with their new Gmail address and they can then get to their classes. And they can find that at each one of our school's web pages is there, how to do that. And then we log in with the ARI student portal. And when they do, all the teacher's websites are already connected right here. So students can, by just going with their Gmail address into the ARIES portal, they can get to all their classes. Now the Gmail account is really important. How do you get that? So all that information is again here linked. If you need help, you can click on this, complete a survey, and someone will get back to you with your Gmail help. How do you, you know how do you get your email working? 
But if you need to learn more about like Google Classroom, what is it or how do I make it work? There's all of these are videos on how to do this stuff, okay? They are all links on like, how do I do discussing with my classmates? Here's how to do that, right? So all of these are links or videos um, on how to do these things um, regarding Google Classroom. So some people had said, how do I, where do I go for help? This is a great resource is this one right here. And again, this, oh, this comes right off of our COVID-19 recovery page. If you just scroll down a little bit, you'll find this information here. We've also added the new school district calendar, which the dates are the same. We just moved our short Wednesdays, our minimum day Wednesdays to Mondays. Um, that'll help when we're back in in-person learning down the road, okay? So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna look for um, any other chat questions. Are there any other questions or comments that people may have? Again, just as a reminder, while people may be typing a question, um, we encourage you to visit this page, maybe bookmark it. Um, if you do that, that will get you back here every time. It's easy to find that way. We update this. I update this about every week or so as new information becomes available or we've progressed through the school year and things change. Um, as we, so right now we're really focusing a lot on our learning continuity and attendance plan, getting input from folks as we finalize what we're doing. Um, and then also information like, because I've heard, had questions from parents already saying like, well, not all of my parents are, uh, not all my teachers are responding. How do I do it? So we've talked a little bit about that. Okay, a question came up here. Uh, would the students on special classes start soon? What we want to do is give parents and families at least two weeks notice. Okay, we think we need to give everyone at least two weeks notice if we start them. So we have uh, a meeting tomorrow on Wednesday with our county superintendents. Uh, I need to find out from them, uh, those of us, because some of our students in special needs classes, it depends on the severity, right? Some of our students have very, very special needs. Uh, they basically are like daily living skills. It's not necessarily like I need help with reading and understanding. It's more like there's very physical issues as well. Those are the most high risk ones where we would start with them first. So if you have a special education student that's in that group, like a daily living skill, and you're part of the County Office of Education plan, those are likely to start sooner than someone who is an RSP student, resource student, getting limited services. Um, even things like uh, speech and language services. We have around 40 students in the district who receive speech and language help. And those, much of that will continue to be online uh, because that is delivered really well online. We would give our, those families a couple of weeks notice and because our teachers need time to prepare as well. Um, so we'll give as much notice as possible. So soon is not, not like next week. It would be a couple of weeks down the road. How should students go about informing their teacher if they need to step away from the computer and take a restroom break? Okay. Um, so what they would need to do is they would just probably just send a, a message. And sometimes the, the, the system, I believe, will let that be a private message. Um, that you can message them privately. I need to use the restroom and step out. Um, that's just good communication that they do that. So they, it's certainly that is permissible. That's also why we've told our teachers not to make the, we do not want our lessons to go the entire class period. We've actually given them instruction. Like if you have a really complex lesson, it can be longer, but if it's a simple lesson or just checking in, like maybe you're doing okay, I'm gonna be online for 10 minutes. Those video lessons, those video conferences can be shorter. Another question came up there around the special education classes. Is this mandatory? I have a high risk child at home as well. No, I don't believe it'd be mandatory. That's really a conversation. We wanna make sure we support the IEP in the case of an individual student. We wanna make sure that that individual education plan is um, adhered to and followed. And if we can do that with distance learning, continuing that, we're gonna to continue to do that. Those will be uh, one by one cases that we'll try and sort out as they come up. Again, I, we're not trying to go any faster than people are ready. The governor just made it available to us and we need to find out how many people are asking for this. Is there a demand? Can we continue in our current distance learning for now until we all know it's safe? Okay. Great, good question. Do you know of any place that might be donating school supplies for families and children who are going through financial hardship? Um, we have a family resource center it's located right on Brighton, right across the street from Central Union High School. 
they have office hours that are open. Um, if you, they probably have resources available to you at that point, at that location. I don't know of another resource that would have that, but we do have those things available at the Family Resource Center right across the street. Uh, I believe they're operating the same office hours as everyone else. Matter of fact, I need to make a note and double check on them, make sure they are. Good question. Okay. I wanna point one more thing out to you. I'm gonna go back and share my screen just a minute in case something comes up and you have an idea or a comment or a question and you're not sure who to ask. I'm gonna share my screen one more time. So right here under learning continuity attendance plan, if you're not able to attend, you can email me. This is my email address, wandress at cuhsd.net. Just put in the subject LCA plan so I'll know what it's about. If you want to make a comment or have a request or a concern um, or a compliment, we'd like compliments too. So if you want to pass any of those, or I love success stories are great. You may come across a success story that is helpful to, that you want to share. So we, we're glad to accept compliments too. And sometimes we need them. Uh, not just, or we will be glad to troubleshoot, but um, we appreciate the compliments as well. So if you have anything else that comes up, feel free to contact us. Uh, let me know and I can either route you to the right people or solve the problem myself. Oh, this is a great question. Thank you, Rosa, great question. When the Corona vaccine is approved, will it be required for students and staff to be vaccinated in order to attend school in person? I have no idea. I have no idea. We have the flu vaccine right now and not everybody gets the flu shot. And now the, the flu, is deadly for some people, kind of like how Corona is deadly for some people, but, and it spreads airborne, very similar, but we don't do a mandatory flu vaccine. The Corona vaccine maybe, but I don't know. That's kind of a question way above, that's a governor question, I think. Um, I don't, I have thought about that. I had this discussion with my wife, who's a teacher uh, in a nearby district. We talked about that this weekend, like how was this gonna play out? So my best guess is that it won't be required. That's my best guess. But I'm gonna get the shot. I'm gonna get my flu shot as soon as it comes out. Um, I, I trust that the, our scientists are doing all the right work to make it safe for everyone. Um, but you, you, you know those people who, they call them the anti-vaxxers or people who don't want vaccines, they may opt out or have a way to opt out. Again, I don't have the answer on this one. They haven't gotten that far yet. Good question though, it's one to think about. All right. Well, folks who are on the call or those who may be watching on our YouTube channel, um, unless there's more questions, I'm not, I'm not a person of like making a meeting go till seven just because we said it was gonna go till seven, just sit around. So I'm glad to conclude early if there's no more questions that I can answer right now. Again, you can go visit our um, recovery plan page, find uh, the um, link and I'll be glad to respond to you. Oh, one more question came in. When we return to in-person teaching, how will you select who comes back and who doesn't? All right, so what we would do is this, is that um, when we are in that phase, we're, we're discovering in our, in our early thinking that it's a very, very complicated answer to those questions right there. Um, we are going to try and identify who is gonna come back, who wants to come back, who, and who needs to come back, and then those who want to stay at home. And we wanna try and group them so that the stay-at-home people can maybe have their own classes and the in-person people are here. That way the stay-at-home teachers who are also doing distance instruction can have groups of those students and those who are in person would come back together with teachers. The real problem becomes in when we do partials, meaning like only 50% of the kids come back and 50% are online. But how does that work for the same classroom teacher in the class? It's a very, very complicated problem, especially when you add in a layer of contract language with teachers and working conditions for teachers and learning and good quality teaching. So there are no right answers on how to do this. Um, we're actually going to be monitoring and watching many of other um, uh, many other districts who are already down the road practicing this and see what they work out. So the question came in, is there, a, is there a high possibility students may go back to campus? I have a feeling, so I hope that answers the question. Who comes back and who doesn't? We want to 
honor family choice. Like someone up there earlier said, I have a, a high risk child. Well, we want to try and accommodate that and keep your child at home. Um, in other cases, they're, they're different health condition or the situation is different and they can return. The part about high possibility of students, when would they go back to campus? I have a feeling, I have just have a feeling that we will stay distance learning for the, until December at least. I don't think that in our county of Imperial County, we will have enough um, variance or enough testing capacity or test, whatever it is, the requirements in terms of test uh, percentages where we would be allowed to go back anytime soon. So it's likely we will be um, distance learning for the full fall semester. Um, even if we are allowed to come back, say at the end of November, December, we may just choose to stay all December, except for those small invitation groups, like, you know, the specialty lab class, uh, just because we need to keep a routine of learning happening for everyone. And we don't want to jerk families back and forth. We certainly don't want to open campus and have infections and have to close campus. That would be a nightmare. So I'd rather go slow rather than going forward and backward and forward and backward. Um, so my, my best guess at this point in time is that we are likely to stay distance learning mode like this through the fall semester. And then uh, hopefully in the spring we, or January, when we get to the, the, the second semester, there's the possibility of a blended learning model. And we may be adjusting schedules depending on what we figure out. I know, hard, those aren't very good answers, but we don't, I, as I told the group this morning, there are no veterans. We don't have any veteran distance learning teachers on staff. We don't have any veteran distance learning administrators or principals on staff. There are no veteran learning, uh, distance learning uh, counselors on staff. This is new to all of us and it's new to our parents and families. So we'll do our best to communicate. Um, that's why I made reference to the, the weekly uh, video and, and news on this page so you can get the latest information. Um, we will though, we've made a commitment to our teachers and we make a commitment to our parents that we'll provide at least two weeks notice before we make any sort of major change. So there's time to accommodate, make new plans, work out new routines if necessary. So we wanna give as much lead time as possible, okay? All right. So again, thanks to all those who were participating, those who had good questions. These are different questions in the morning group, so I appreciate that. Um, so, it, good. Um, thanks everyone. Looks like I got a thank you here at the end. All right. I'm going to copy the chat. I want to make sure I get it. So thanks everyone for participating. Uh, go ahead and log off when you're done. We will, um, oh great. There it is. I think I'm just trying to save my chat. See, I'm learning at the same time. Like, where do I drag this stuff to? Well, I, I, I would, if I were your classroom teacher, this is maybe what you'd see. I'd be like fumbling, like, how do I do this? Hold on, everybody. And lots of our teachers are struggling, um, trying to learn and get it going on. Really authentic, right? We're all in this together. So thanks everyone for participating. Appreciate you very much. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to call. Yes, and be safe everyone. Stay safe. Thanks. And Mr. Ramon, if you'd like to go ahead and close us out.